great to have you here this afternoon. I'm, I, I told Mark I'll make this incredibly short. So I'm Claude Cochini, I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, and I kind of manage this process of recognizing our senior faculty for the entire college. And so today we have the distinct pleasure of having Mark Lundstrom, who is uh, the Cypress Distinguished Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering. And I told him he is so well known in this <laughs> college and on this campus that he doesn't need us to tell you his whole biography. So we're really looking forward to hearing what he has to say about his experience at Purdue. Thank OK. You, thank you, Claude. OK. So thank you all for being here. Um, one of the instructions that I got in my email from Claude was that this talk didn't have to be a standard talk. We could do something different. So thanks for being a good sport. I'm going to do something a, li a little different here, just in the first part of the talk. Some of you didn't come for this talk, but this is the main part of the talk. This is what I want to talk about. But there were some uh, thoughts that I wanted to uh, to bring up for discussion, and I hope that in the reception afterwards we might talk about this. So um, some of you might be wondering, you know, what is this series all about? You know, um, I asked a lot of my colleagues, and I found most of them don't know what this new series is all about. I actually hope it's not to recognize our achievements, I, because I think there's something more important that we can do with these seminars. So it all seems to be traced back to a faculty committee that met one or two years ago. This was the key recommendation of the faculty committee that we proposed that all, I think this refers to all tenured full professors in the College of Engineering, tenured professors, present a colloquium on their achievements and plans to their peers, followed by a discussion with the dean and their head on a regular seven-year cycle. Okay, seems like a reasonable thing to do. Um, now, this was all explained in the email that Claude sent to me. And there are attachments that you can read and you can learn more about that. But you know, I asked, so I'm polling people that I bump into. And I'm asking them, do you know in engineering that we now have a formal post-tenure review process? Not a single person that I've bumped into is aware of that yet. It's in the email. All you have to do is read it. Um, I asked four or five of my colleagues who are giving this talk later on in the semester if they knew what their talk was all about. Not a single one had it, because wh what they do is they read the first two sentences of their email. And I, who can blame them? We're all so busy. So I thought this is important, and it's something that we ought to discuss a little bit. And I have two slides on this, and th that's all I want to say. Um, so the faculty committee you know, made a couple of points. One is that they said that this is an opportunity for Purdue, uh, for the College of Engineering and Purdue, to lead in post-tenure review. So I happen, so that's a good, potentially a good idea. I happen to think that this could be a positive thing for two reasons. You know, one is that as faculty, we have a great job. You know, everybody I know is working flat out, but it's like a mission, it's a calling. You're doing the work you love to do. But we paid well, we have a good deal of freedom in what we choose to do. It's not unreasonable every seven years to explain to our peers and to the public what it is we're doing with this wonderful opportunity that we have to be at a great university and work with these bright students and terrific colleagues. Now, the second reason that I think that this could be a good idea is I remember hearing something in the last week or two from our president. And I think, I think the way he stated it is our ambition is to be the best university between the coasts. Um, that's a really ambitious thing. When you start thinking about some of the universities between the coasts, there are some really good universities between the coasts. Right? We shouldn't say things like this unless we're really serious about doing it. And this could be a way that we could help you know, achieve that objective. Every seven years, each of us gets a chance to explain what we're doing in either research, education, or engagement to help Purdue be the best university between the coasts. And then in the follow-up, we get to meet with our department head and the dean and talk about what help that we need to do even more. So this could potentially be a very good thing. But we need to talk about it. You know, people need to be aware of it. Everyone in engineering should be talking about it. 
Everyone in Purdue should be talking about what the College of Engineering is doing. This committee thought we could be national leaders in this. We should be getting national attention for it. So that's why I'm speaking about it now, and I hope you'll start thinking about it. So here are my recommendations. Now, I think it should be focused on helping us raise the, the excellent work to a new level of excellence here. We need to be clear about what we're doing. Even though it's all in the emails, it's obviously it's not clear to people yet. We, we need to figure out a way to, to make that clear. We should explain why we're doing it. So we're all reviewed once a year from our, by our heads. Uh, you, know, you can see that maybe that's not enough for a formal post-tenure review. But we should explain why, why some modifications to that process aren't enough, why we need a formal process. Should be clear what the process is. It, we should really think about faculty time. You know, it, it, takes a, it takes time to prepare a presentation like this. Everyone I know is working flat out. It, it's, not a, it's not a matter of working a few more hours in the week that you're doing this. It means you're going to do something. You're not going to do something you would have done in order to do this. I don't mind it as long as this is a meaningful exercise and it's going to help make us better. Uh, it should apply to all faculty in your role as a faculty member. And in particular, I think our administrators should lead. So I'll issue a challenge. I'm issuing it to Tim Sands, our lead administrator from a faculty point of view. I'm on some of the PhD committees with Tim. I know he's doing some exciting work. Uh, you know, if this is so important, our administration should demonstrate that they believe that it is important by being some of the first people who give these seminars on their work as faculty members. You know, not on their work as administrators. I assume there are other reviews for that. And I'd, you know, and uh, we, perhaps our, our provost, Tim Sands, can do us a favor and set a good example before he leaves for his new job. And finally, I think that this should all be presented as part of a bigger effort to say that when we say we want to be the best university between the coasts, we really mean this. We're going to work hard to do at, at, at doing this. And this is part of a process to help us all be better. And uh, it's going to require not only effort by the faculty, but it's going to require resources to help people achieve their bigger dreams. So I think it could be a good thing. All right, so that's the end of my speech. That's my two cents worth. Um, I'll see whether Claude or or Raghu want to say anything. I don't want to get into a long discussion because I have a lot of slides to present on my main topic. But what I'm really hoping is that we can chat about this if you have time after the presentation. Are you going to? Don't need to say anything at this? No? That's I, wanna, I want you to have all your time. <laughs> OK. <laughs> all right. OK, I'm going to dive into the, th this is the talk. You know, and I apologize to those of you who aren't faculty. You know, this is to be an opportunity to speak to your peers, and I'm glad to see many of them here. So what I said probably um, means more to the faculty members than it does to the rest of you. But I hope the rest of you will be interested in electronics. So in trying to think about if I were going to one of these talks, what would I like to hear? I'd like to hear something about the field that the person is working in. I'd like to understand what are the big challenges and opportunities in that field. And I'd like to know what are you working on? You know, what are you doing in response to that? So I'll try to dive into that. So this is Moore's Law. You know, so this has sort of been very important to me. This, these are the number of transistors on an integrated circuit chip versus a year. And they're kind of, there's one important date here. That's 1974. That was my first job at Hewlett Packard developing integrated circuit processes that were really pushing the state of the art. It was really, really hard to make five micrometer channel length devices work. We now measure them in nanometers. That was 5,000 nanometers. Nobody had any idea how far this would go. Now the big question is, can we get to five nanometers? You know, it might be possible. It's going to be really, really hard. The active development now is at, is at 10 nanometers. And that will take us to, what, 2020, 2025. But you can begin to see you know, where this is heading. It's going to be hard to get smaller than that because we're starting to talk about single atoms, things like this. OK, so 
from 5,000 to 5 nanometers. And this has really shaped the modern world. That's a 1,000, a factor of 1,000 decrease in the dimension of a transistor, a factor of a million decrease in the area. You could put a few thousand transistors on a chip when I was working at HP. Now you can put billions of transistors on a chip. Okay. And that's all driven by device scaling. So I've spent a lot of my career trying to think about this problem. Looks very simple. Here's a MOSFET. It's very descriptive. This is a source of electrons. The, they move out of the source, across the channel, and they come out to drain. And the gate between either turns it on or off. The critical dimension is this length of the channel. You make that shorter, everything else gets smaller. Everything gets smaller, you put more on the, on the chip. Everything gets better, faster, cheaper, more reliable, and it all, all works better. So all we have to do is every technology generation, every 18 months or so, decrease the length of the channel by the factor of the square root of two. We decrease the size by a factor of two. Moore's law continues. And even Moore had no idea that it would continue for as long as it has. And it's not over yet. Okay. So this whole thing has really shaped the, 21st, the 20th century and the 21st century. The transistor itself was invented in Bell Labs. You know, the other major area of activity that almost invented the transistor, where was it? Did anybody know? It was hot on their heels. Physics department over here at Purdue. It was a hotbed of semiconductor research at the time. Uh, and you know, no one would have predicted. You look at this thing, you know, it looks like it's made out of paper clips and, and things. No one, w I don't think anyone, even the people that invented this, had no idea what they had invented or what it could lead to. <laughs> but this is what it's led to now. 2007, we had the iPhone introduced. We have this personal electronics, and this is going to shape. Uh, the future of electronics for a long time. And everywhere I go, we're all asking ourselves these questions. You know, what is the future of electronics? Where is this all going? You know, students ask it, faculty ask it. You know, we've had this Moore's Law, we can begin to see the end of device scaling, then what? So what do we do with that? So, you know, let's see what this has opened up. Let me see if I can play this. I apologize for showing one from another university, but this is, this is my alma mater. A, former, a classmate of mine sent this to me. So this is really cool, Mark. <laughs> this is the University of Minnesota, another good land-grant university. So I know. It's all about helping people with a disability or various neurodegenerative disease. Okay. So I don't know if you could hear that from the back of the room, but you get the idea. I mean, that would seem like science fiction a few years ago. You know, I, had a, I was at a talk uh, a month ago where a colleague pointed out that almost every gadget in the original Star Trek now exists. You know. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. I don't know how significant this is. I know there's work like this going on at Purdue. I couldn't find the right video. But what we're going to see in the next 20 or 30 years, enabled by this tech, amazing technology, 
is going to seem like science fiction. So uh, those of us who work down on the basic technology, we work on transistors and integrated circuits and memory cells and lasers and light emitting diodes. We work in this basic technology. And that has created this enormous lever. There's almost an infinite number of things that you can do now with this capability that's been, uh, that's been developed. So there's an enormous amount of leverage All right. Let me figure out why I can't advance this thing now. All right, I have technical difficulties here. It's advancing on my screen, but it's not advancing on your screen. Now it works? Okay. All right. So, you know, we could just declare victory and stop. Most people wouldn't know it for another 20 or 30 years. You know, the technology has almost unlimited potential. And that's what 50 years of Moore's Law has done. So it's had enormous impact. It's almost impossible to overstate the impact that this technology that we witnessed has had, except I think maybe Isaac Asimov did overstate it just a little bit. He said that the invention of the process used to manufacture integrated circuits was the most important moment since mankind emerged as a life form. All right, maybe that's a little over the top, but it is really, really important. So I want to say a couple of things. Um, anybody know who Frederick Terman was? Who was he? He's born in Indiana. He was a Hoosier, but he, but he moved out early. He's fam yeah, he's famous for two things. One is he made Stanford from a good university to what it is today. He's there for 40 years or so. And the other thing that he's known as? The father of Silicon Valley. You know, he encouraged Hewlett and Packard to come back and start a company there and got it all going. So an alum sent me this a few years ago. This is a speech that Frederick Terman gave uh, at a national conference in Chicago in 1960. You know, so let's see what he had to say about electronics in 1960. So he talked about the new electronics, not vacuum tube electronics but he was talking about a new electronics that emerged out of science, requires a high level of competence, grows by the development of new things that you can't do with vacuum tubes, and it's all made possible by the transistor and solid state devices. So this all came out of World War II. You know, when people had problems to solve, uh, semiconductor technology really started then with diodes for radar detectors. You know, the engineering profession was actually embarrassed. I don't know how much many of you know this story. It was large, most of the people doing those fundamentally new things were physicists and scientists. It showed what science could do. And the strong emphasis on science in engineering education came after World War II, when engineering saw what, what science could do. I can still remember when I was a kid reading my ham radio magazines, I remember an editorial talking about how terrible it was that electrical engineers could get a degree and not know how to solder. You know, there had been a, just a dramatic change in the, in the curriculum. Um, and he's pointing out, in this speech, he pointed out that in order to participate in this new electronics, you need graduate training. And he sort of took the Midwest to task to say, you're not, doing, you're not putting enough emphasis the PhDs in Boston and San Francisco are creating the new electronics, and you're churning out people to go into existing technologies. Uh, he talks about how industry is discovering you want to be located next to a university, a center of brains, and he asks, why isn't that happening in the Midwest? And you know, he's really, you, you read this, he's really pretty tough on the Midwest. And he says, you know, the basic problem is You've been more interested in preparing people in established areas to go to work in established companies and get a good job rather than in opening up and entering 
new fields of activity. 1960, he saw this all coming in 1960. You know, it's just amazing. Okay, so I want to, you know, then skip ahead to some more recent, you know, things that, uh, that I thought about and some of the things that we did here at Purdue. And I want to go back to about the year 2000. So one of the histories of this event is, you know, this is Moore's Law again, but it's plotted in a different way. So here's the size of the device. Every time the size goes down, you get more transistors on a chip. Everything works better and is more powerful. So around the turn of the century, we were very, very pessimistic. You know, there were many times that we were very pessimistic. It just didn't look like you could make a transistor any smaller. Going below 100 nanometers looked almost impossible. I wish I could find the citation for this. I can't find it anymore. There are lots of exciting things happening. People were beginning to put single, simple molecules between electrodes and understand the IV characteristics. Bill Clinton launched the National Nanotechnology Initiative by saying, we're going to build a thousand pentiums on a grain of sand with molecular electronics. Now, actually, that was silly. Okay. But some good things happened. One of the first efforts in this area was led by Suprio. By uh, Suprio in uh, EE, Ron Reifenberger in physics, and Cliff Kubiak, who was in chemistry here at Purdue at the time. They measured, I think, the first IV characteristics of a molecule and learned how to understand the IV characteristics of the smallest device you could imagine making. That was really, I think, the most significant thing that came out of that, an understanding of how small, how current flows at an atomic scale. Now, about this time, I was undergoing some kind of career crisis. You know, what do I do? I'd been in the dean's office for three years. Um, it was hard to keep my research going. I came back to it, and I didn't see where this field was heading, and everyone was pessimistic. You know, I spent two or three or four years flailing around, you know, what should I be doing with the rest? You know, I've got a long time left in my career. What should I be doing? And I hit on this idea that I thought, I'll invite the brightest people I know, and we'll have a workshop, and we'll talk about what needs to be done in the future. And maybe from that I can figure out what to do. You know, but I didn't know that, I didn't believe that, well, you know, are they going to come to a workshop that I organize? So I invited some famous people to do it with me. I had to do all the work, you know, but we did it. Every single person I invited said, yes, I'll come. Uh, we had a wonderful meeting. Uh, we had to write a report to the sponsors. I had just read a, a book by a fellow named John Kenneth Galbraith. Anybody know who he is? He was a famous economist, you know, worked in Washington for a long time, World War II and after. And he pointed out something he learned. Every time he was on a committee, he always volunteered to write the report. Because he said, then the official record of that committee is my view of what happened. <laughs> so I volunteered to write the report. Right? I passed it by all my co-organizers. They're busy people. And they said, yeah, yeah, it looks fine. Okay. Uh, but suddenly a light bulb clicked on during this. It suddenly became apparent to me what needs to be done. And it became apparent to me that no amount of money is going to be spared to pushing this technology as small as it can possibly be. As long as there are no physical limitations, we will, we will keep going. And molecular electronics has demonstrated to us that we can make molecular scale devices. The smallest practical devices are likely to be silicon transistors. They're going to be very interesting scientifically. And we need to dive in. We can take the tools and techniques that the people working on molecular electronics took, and we can apply them to silicon transistors, and we can look out 15 years. But now when we look out 15 years, people will believe us because we're using tools and techniques that have been experimentally verified on IV characteristics of single molecules. I wrote the report. Now, a funding agency said, Mark, do you think we could use this report as a call for proposals? I said, sure, why not? I wrote a proposal. Guess what? They funded it. And we were off and running because I was perfectly aligned with the call for proposal. So, so that was a good experience. You know, and basically, you know, we did things. We, we took these techniques that Suprio 
had pioneered and that uh, Gerhard Klimek now has to develop to a very high state of, uh, of ability. And we applied them to the first time for very small transistors. We could see all these quantum mechanical reflections and tunneling. We could look out 15 years. Uh, in the process of doing that, we discovered that we've also developed the capability to look at some very novel devices that were just popping out of research labs, things like carbon nanotubes. You know, before that, as electrical engineers, we didn't really understand how to analyze these devices. They were so different. Now they were obvious because we, we, we knew how to treat a molecule. This is just a countable number of molecules. So we were able to, uh, to work with a, a chemist and his group at, uh, at uh, Stanford. This work got a lot of attention, probably a little overhyped. You know, so here's a news article in Nature about this work saying, remember the vacuum tube was replaced by the transistor, and now it's going to be replaced by the carbon nanotube. You know, well, maybe. But it was exciting. We had, a, we had a lot of fun. And I knew I was working on the right field because every time I would go and give a talk at a conference or a workshop or whatever, I'd get emails from graduate students saying, I want to transfer to Purdue and work on these problems. So I knew I had found, you know, after a few years of flailing around, I had found the right thing to do. Uh, one of the things I want to mention, part of what there began to be a, a, you know, a view that some people had is these are very sophisticated techniques. You're working, you're simulating at the atomistic scale, you're treating quantum mechanics. It's all very complicated. In fact, I even heard people at a conference say, these small devices have become so complicated. You could just run a simulation and that's the answer. That's all you can do. I thought, well, that doesn't sound right. You know, something that is small and consists of only a few molecules should be simpler than a chunk of silicon that consists of 10 to the 26 atoms or something. So we began to think about, you know, how can we understand these MOSFETs? So, and here's the only technical part of the talk. I'm going to draw the electron energy versus position through the source, across the channel, and out the drain and explain to you in a couple of sentences how a transistor works. Because this, you know, this is made the 20, 20th and 21st century. We should know how this works. Here's what the potential energy looks like. This is the source of electrons. There's a big energy barrier in the channel. And then it goes down in the drain. Electrons stay in the source because they can't get over the barrier. No current flows. Okay, what if I apply a voltage? So let me apply a voltage. I remember from freshman physics that if I apply a voltage, it lowers the energy of the electrons. So let me apply a voltage over here to the drain. So I'll take the drain, I apply a voltage, I pull all the energy down. The device is still off because there's still this big barrier between the source and the channel. Okay, so then I apply a voltage to the gate. If I apply a voltage to the gate, pushes the barrier down because energy is minus Q times voltage. Pushes the barrier down, now electrons can hop over and they flow. That's all there is to a transistor, manipulating the potential energy barrier so that the electrons can get out of the source and flow across the channel and into the drain. Of course, it's really, really complicated to make it work the way it's supposed to work, but it's really simple at the end. Okay. So Claude told me I could have fun with this, so you know, I hope you'll... <laughs> you know. So here's the paper I wrote. So we wrote this paper, or, you know, this is the first paper I wrote, uh, in 1997. People thought you know, these devices are enormously complicated, and the point of this paper was to say it's not that complicated. In fact, it's really simple. And I developed this equation, which I learned. I took Ciprio's ideas, and I said, how would you apply that to a MOSFET? I came up with a simple little formula, sent it out for review. You know how this all goes. You go through review, and the reviewers beat you up. The reviewers weren't too bad, but, but the one com criticism was, well, this is a nice little paper. There's only one problem. Any undergraduate could understand this. And you know, my response to the editor was, that's exactly why you need to write, publish this paper, because it's not that complicated. You know, people think it's complicated. So that was a lot of fun. OK, so I want to show you my Google Scholar citations. Uh, you know, don't pay attention to the numbers. Some of my colleagues have much better numbers. These aren't too bad. But, but the point I want to make is that something happened here about this time in, in my career. Um, and what happened? A few things. One is I thought really, really hard. You know, 
I was sort of doing okay along this time. I made IEEE fellow. I was telling my colleagues, I don't know what I should do next. I can't get excited. And they said, well, Mark, you solved the 1D Boltzmann equation. Solve the 2D Boltzmann equation. That'll take you for a few years. Then solve the 3D Boltzmann equation. Right? Then solve the quantum transport equation. You can go for another 20 years. I said, yeah, but I'm just not excited about that. And you know, all that hard work to think about where is the opportunity? You know, what, what is it that people aren't doing was really worthwhile. Maybe why, why, these, why this exercise is worthwhile. Um, I was really lucky. Th this was a project that started by accident. Some of you know about the NanoHub, the Science Gateway. Uh, this just started uh, in the corner of my lab. We started giving away all of the software to do this. And then we thought, well, we need to have lectures and tutorials so people understand this new way of thinking. We put that all out too. Uh, that was enormously useful because people could pick up the code, they could read it, they could write their own code. It, it gave the work more impact than it would have had because we just made it easy for people to pick it up. The Purdue support was really important. Um, Purdue, there would be no NanoHub today if Purdue hadn't supported it at the right time. And uh, there was a provost who probably wasn't so popular at that time. He taxed all of the deans. It took some money back. And then he reallocated it to projects. It was called the Academic Reinvestment Program. Then he gave the dollars back to a few projects. We were one that got it. And that kept NanoHub alive long enough until we had an opportunity to write a major grant, major proposal to NSF and really scale it up. If that hadn't happened, there, there would be no NanoHub today. The other thing that happened, which I thought was really good, is we had a new VP for information technology. He arrived on campus. And I got a phone call or email from his assistant saying, you know, he'd like to come and talk with you. And I said, well, OK, fine. Uh, you know, he's a busy person. You know, I'll, I'll go over to Hawkins or wherever they are now, and I'll, I'll talk with him. He said, no, no, no. He wants to talk to you in your office. OK. So he came over, and he met me. And he said, he said Mark, we'd like to work with you. I said, OK. Um, I don't really need your help in anything now. And he said, but we want to work with you. Next time you have a project, you know, come and see me. Okay. We had an opportunity to submit a proposal to NSF for $10 million for this NanoHub project, and this was not something I could do out of the corner of my lab. I went over and talked to him. I said, you remember what you said? He said, I need your help. And we couldn't have done it unless we'd had that help. Now, I thought that was really good. I mean, that was a, an administrator was not trying to say, we have this initiative that we'd like to interest you into participating. It was, we want to work with you. Whatever you want to do, we want to work with you on that project. Now, I sort of see that as a possible outcome of this exercise we're going through. We're supposed to be here talking about our plans and what we'd like to accomplish. Then we're going to follow this up with a meeting with our dean and department head. And you can help us figure out how we can get the resources that we need in order to do this. It might not be financial. It just might be flexibility and freeing up time and things, whatever we need to do, do to do that. So that could be a good thing to do. OK, so I've told you about the field. Let me tell you, I'm sorry, I'm racing through this. but uh, And I'm going to be very short on this, even though I am busy these days. But let me tell you about the big challenge. So what's the big challenge in electronics today? It's mainly power. You have these personal electronics, the batteries run down. You know, we're going to get more and more, and we want to put more and more electronics in them. They access cloud computing. You know, what does it take? You know, some, something like 30 nuclear power plants to generate the electricity that these server farms use now. They build them next to hydro plants so that they're right next to the power. Uh, you can, when you put billions of transistors on a chip, and then you put many chips in one of these packages, and then they go out and they access servers on the cloud, it just consumes an enormous amount of power. That's the biggest challenge that we have. So then we have to talk about some basic double E. This is the basic circuit that we use in CMOS. It's an inverter. You put a one in, you get a zero out, and vice versa. This is a P-channel MOSFET. This is an N-channel complementary versions of the transistor. And the way this works is very simple. This output is connected to some wires and connections to other devices, so there's a whole bunch of capacitance. Okay. When your input is low, this transistor is on, you pump charge into that capacitor. 
now it's charged up to a 1. When your input goes high, it turns this transistor on, it takes that charge and dumps it out, and you convert your 1 to a 0. Right? That's CMOS. So it's really easy to see the energy, just basic double D. You, you put CV squared energy and you store it in the capacitor. You're operating at some frequency. So the power that you dissipate is frequency times CV squared. Frequency is, what, the gigahertz or so? Capacitance with all the wires and everything is on the order of a femtofarad. Voltage is about one volt in the battery in your device. You've got about a billion transistors on the chip. You do the numbers, that's a kilowatt. All right. All right. You're not, you're not dissipating a kilowatt or, or you'd have a blister or, you know, or something, you know. It means that every one of those transistors isn't on at the same time. But this is the problem. It just takes an awful lot of power. So you might say, well, you don't want to run it slower because you have a lot of work you want to do. Uh, you have wires connecting up these billions of transistors. It's really hard to lower the capacitance. Why don't you just lower the voltage? Okay. Well, that turns out to be the big challenge for us. So here's the IV characteristic of a MOSFET. When you vo gate voltage is low, there are very few electrons can hop over that barrier. That's leakage current. We used to ignore that. It was so small. But now when you put a billion transistors on the chip, you can't ignore it. You know, something like a third of the power is just leakage when you're off. And then when you're on, you have to have enough current that you can charge that capacitor up, and you can pull the charge out, and you can do it at a gigahertz so you can run fast. So you need a good hefty current. And the nature of a MOSFET is just that it takes about one volt in order to push that barrier from high enough to be off to low enough to be on. And it is really hard, just based on the physics of how that device works, to get much below one volt. Okay, so this is a big research problem. And um, there's a lot of work going on in this area. You know, one flavor of transistor uses a completely different physics. It was first demonstrated by Jörg Appenzeller in IBM research, and there's a lot of activity in this kind of transistor. Another one makes use of some really novel negative capacitance. You make a gate oxide that behaves as though its capacitance is negative. It's actually being demonstrated now by Cyprio student at UC Berkeley. A lot of people think that spintronics, if we use the spin of an electron instead of its charge as the entity that carries the information, we might be able to lower the power. Uh, Cyprio has been a real pioneer in that too. So there's some really interesting work going on. But one of the things we've learned in the last 10 or 15 years is it's really, really hard to beat a silicon MOSFET. It's possible that some of these may be able to complement a chip and do part of the signal processing in different ways that are more power, power efficient. But it's, uh, it's a big challenge. So, okay. so that could, you know, you know, sometimes people get pessimistic. So this is back about the year 2000. People were pessimistic. And science asked me to write a, you know, everyone is talking about 1,000 pentiums on a grain of sand. Um, you know, there was really a widespread perception that this technology has run its course. I was more optimistic. So I'm glad, you know, at some point. I don't, I'm not always right. But I wrote this basically, so this is, obviously it's not going to go forever. But my point was, it's not over yet. We've just seen the beginning. It's going to go for a long ways. And, you know, one of, the, one of the approaches I made there is that when we finally get down to five nanometers, we may have hit the limit in how small we can make it. But that doesn't mean that it's going to end. There are other ways to keep this going. You know, one of the obvious ways to go 3D, instead of just putting more transistors on a plane, just start stacking them up. That's happening already. So this technology is not going to hit a red brick wall. It's going to go for another 10, 20 years. Uh, that's for sure. So the question that we have in research these days is, uh, is there a new, new electronics? Or are we seeing that we will push this to its logical conclusion and then it will be like, I don't know what, you know, other technologies that saturate and they, they don't grow exponentially the way we've been used to, 50 years of exponential growth. Uh, well, so, uh, 
so Terman, back in 1960, said that this new kind of electronics, it's really all about doing something different. It's not about <coughs> refining existing ideas. Some of what we need to do is to keep Moore's Law going, make transistors better, keep pushing silicon technology. That needs to be done. But the really interesting thing for a university is, are there brand new ideas to do things that are completely different? That's what we should be thinking about. Okay, so this is another area. So these seminars are an opportunity for planning. I think some of my students probably think I overplan. You know, it takes years. So th this is an activity I've been involved in with some uh, NSF panels and things for three or four years now, trying to figure out where technology is going. And so one of the things we observe is nanotechnology began as microtechnology, has undergone 50 years of evolution and has become enormously powerful. Information technology has gone right along with it. Biotechnology has undergone a similar evolution and now is incredibly powerful in being able to engineer genes and things. And we're be human cognition isn't quite as far. We don't quite understand human cognition as well as, as we do the other fields. But uh, there's an awful lot happening there. And when we, more and more, when I'm on panels and committees and things, you have cognitive scientists that are on those panels. So this is the era of multidisciplinary research. Almost all of the big problems that we work on these days involve electronics, but they involve electronics in connection with, with these other great technologies of the 20th century. Okay. Now, there's all kinds of opportunities. One of the things that this does is it creates all kinds of opportunities. You start thinking, one of the things you start thinking about is, what could I use this enormously sophisticated technology for? We spent 50 years developing it to do information processing and communication. What else might it be used for? So here's one example. You know, so this is, this is gene sequencing done by a method called the uh, Sanger method. Sanger just passed away here recently, I guess. The cost of sequencing a gene was going down on its own Moore's Law curve. And then something happened recently. Suddenly it started dropping, plummeting. What happened? Well, this is what one of the ways that that happened is that people discovered that I could take this silicon technology, not even state-of-the-art silicon technology, and I could adapt it to a different purpose. So here's a... CMOS chip, and this now has become an ion sensitive FET. It'll sense the charge on the DNA strand, and you can do this sequencing massively parallel because you've got arrays of these 45 um, nanometer transistors. And you can take standard silicon technology and use it for something completely different. There's just enormous opportunities there to think about how could you do that. I saw yesterday we had a speaker on campus for the Sigma Xi. Uh, seminar, who was talking about doing something in designing medicines. He, he was talking about the fact that electronic devices over this period of Moore's Law have gone from the size of a red blood corpuscle to a vaccine. And that has opened up all kinds of opportunities for designing medicines and, and uh, vaccines and things like that. He was using silicon technology. You know, you take photographs with your cell phone. You know, there's CMOS imagers in there. It's an example. CMOS transistors were designed as digital switches. Somebody figured out you could use them as imaging devices. So what other possibilities are there? Probably a lot. So there are all kinds of exciting things happening. This, here's John Rogers from uh, over in Illinois, close to us. So John is doing all kinds of really interesting things. One of the things that he's doing is taking silicon electronics and making it thin and flexible and stretchable. So he can make electronic circuits that he can then stretch and wrap around the heart muscle and monitor the electrical activity. And if you want to read about, I mean, it all sounds like science fiction. If you want to read about the things that he's doing and, and basically trying to merge electronics and, uh, and human health and biology, you know, there's a nice article in the New Yorker. All kinds of activity in artificial intelligence and robotics. Uh, and some really important questions to think about, I think. You know, where is this all heading? The, the, impl the, the implications for society could be enormous. Um, so robots, so George can tell me. <laughs> you know, robots are more and more powerful. They're going to be doing more and more things. You can conceive, I don't know what, if George thinks that this is likely or not, but I, you know, it doesn't seem unreasonable. 
that in the future you could have robots doing most of what human beings are doing now. You know, so this particular article is saying, what if seven out of 10 jobs are replaced by robots? What do those people do? So <laughs> there's some things to think about. So what's happening here is really interesting, I think. So these are really exciting times that we're living in. And it's really moving beyond multidisciplinary research. So I would think of multidisciplinary research as you put different disciplines together to solve a problem. The disciplines don't change. They just come together, they solve a problem. But when I think of convergence, it's more than multidisciplinary. I mean, convergence actually changes the disciplines. And it is quite likely that the evolution of electronics is going to be different because it's going to be closely linked to biology and other problems. Uh, the evolution, evolution of biology and medicine will be different because it will be more tightly linked to electronics. New fields might emerge. You know, we had an example. In the 1960s, semiconductor electronics emerged as a distinct discipline. You couldn't do electronics the way you did with vacuum tubes. And it wasn't condensed matter physics the way it's taught in physics departments. You know, it was a whole new field. So I've been thinking about, you know, what do students need? How do we prepare our students for this brave new world? So I believe that they continue to need to be deep in a field. You can't contribute much to this interdisciplinary kind of work unless you really have a core expertise. But you have to have a much broader understanding of related technologies than we have in the past. I think. And things are happening so fast, you have to be able to learn, adapt, and evolve quickly. So that has some implications on what we do. OK, so that brings me. I'm going to quickly talk about some of the projects that I'm involved in to try to address some of those challenges and opportunities. Uh, so one of the things is you ask, you know, where will this? So those of us in universities, we should be thinking about opening up new areas of, of activity. You know, how will we find those new areas of activity? So where will they come from? Well, where did the new electronics come from? It came from World War II, really. It came from World War II when a whole bunch of people had to be put together because they had really important problems that they had to solve quickly. And they solved them in really creative new ways. Semiconductor technology got its start then. So it, it came out of solving problems and then identifying you know, what are the longer term opportunities and research questions now that we can continue on after the war was over. Uh, some of you may have heard this term pasteur's quadrant. So they talk about they talk about different ways of doing science. You know, there's Niels Bohr, where you just work on fundamental questions, and sometime later that might lead to something. All right, quantum mechanics is a success of that. But you talk about pasteur, you know, trying to develop vaccines. You try to solve a problem, and you let the problem define the research questions for you. So this is what I've decided that I need to do is I need to get involved in lots of different problems and find out what are, what are the fundamental issues that we need to be focusing on longer term. So here's one project. Uh, this is NEEDS, Nano-Engineered Electronic Device Simulation. It's a project that in, is led by us at Purdue. It involves MIT, Berkeley, and Stanford. It has one aspect is to develop compact models, so it has a number. Its basic mission, I'll explain it this way, is that we can do detailed, sophisticated simulations of electronic materials and devices. But then in order to understand what we're doing, we need to encapsulate them in a simple analytical model. That model tells us how we, it, it tells us how we interpret the experiments. It helps us interpret the detailed simulations. It tells us what experiments to do, what simulations to do. And it's our conceptual understanding of the technology. Now, when you add, yeah, but what we want to do is to connect this work to applications. We want designers to be able to design new products and do new things with these novel devices. So when you add to that an understanding of how circuit simulators like SPICE work, what they need in order to converge and work efficiently, then you have what people call a compact model. And that's what the mission of this uh, effort is all about. It is to develop models that designers can use for novel devices that are coming out of research labs to try to connect work at the basic materials and device physics end to the circuits and systems end uh, better. So what I like about it is it puts us at the center of a whole variety of 
different kinds of technologies that are being exp uh, explored for a whole range of different uh, applications. Now, another way of doing this is we've just recently got involved with Pedro Irizoki. Pedro is a part of this initiative. So Pedro works on, he's here in biomedical engineering at Purdue, for those of you that don't know. He works on implantable networks of wireless nanoelectronic devices, uh, working on problems like epi epilepsy and seizure control. So they're building, they're building electronics with existing technology. And his question is, what else might I be able to do with the technologies that you folks are exploring in places like Burke? So this is an opportunity for us to get closer connected to those problems and to think about what the applications of our work might be or what kind of device or materials that we might develop that would address those applications. And the final thing I'll mention in the projects that I, have in, uh, that I am involved in right now has to do with education. So in the 1960s, you know, there, was a, there was a group of people led by Dick Adler at MIT. There were six or seven different people. And this was 10 years or so after the invention of the transistor. And these people realized the future is semiconductor electronics, it's transistors. Right. This is one year after the invention of the integrated circuit. But there were no textbooks to teach people this. Uh, they got together and they wrote a series of paperback books that were low cost and expensive. And this was really, for the first time, it defined the field. It defined this is what semiconductor electronics is. This is how you think about electronic devices. This is how you think about their connection to circuits. This is how you design circuits with transistors. You can't do it like you design circuits with vacuum tubes. And suddenly, every university in the country could teach semiconductor electronics. And if you read these books, they still seem to be modern. Because for the first time, they conceptualized the field and put it together in a way that we still think about it. So one of the things we've been thinking about is it's time. You know, it's, it's 50 years later, more than 50 years later. We have all of these advances in nanoscience, but our textbooks still look like these. Oh, they might have an extra chapter at the end that has some carbon nanotube. But we haven't really taken the lessons that we've learned from nanoscience and rethought the fields. So we have two things going on. One is a lecture note series, and one is something we call NanoHub U. So uh, the lecture note series, this is very much like the SEEK series. So we have a series, we have about 10 of these things uh, in production now, just signing up another author this week. Uh, the idea is to present new viewpoints you know, that are still emerging, to take what we're learning from research in places like Burke and to present it as textbooks, not research monographs, but to try to view traditional topics in a different perspective. So Cipriano has something he calls the new Ohm's law. You know, you can now understand what the resistance is of a single molecule, and you can teach it to an undergraduate. It gives you a whole different way. Now small things don't look complicated. Small things look simple, and then you can build up to bigger things. And the goal here is to make each one of these volumes accessible to anyone that has a bachelor's degree in the physical sciences or engineering so that you don't need a long string of prerequisites. It's to try to help people that are going to work on many different problems and many different technologies that need a starting point. Okay, so we're having a lot of fun with that. And closely related to that is uh, this effort we call NanoHub U. I could give an hour-long presentation about this, but I only have one slide. So these are a series of short courses with the same philosophy. Short five-week courses so that if you if you want to learn about a new topic, you have a new research project, you haven't taken a course in this area, maybe courses don't exist. Our goal is only to offer courses that don't exist. Uh, you can take a course, same philosophy as a lecture note series. If you have a BS degree in physical sciences or engineering, you should be able to dive in and take any one of these. It's not, it's not a shallow survey course. It's real, really significant content. Once you take that, you should be able to learn the rest that you need. So we have about a dozen courses that we've offered. It's also having an awful lot of impact on what we do in the classroom here at Purdue. So every instructor that has developed courses, and we have about a dozen of them now, who has developed courses for this. And those courses are used, we've had engineers from 100 different companies use them. We had students from 
three or four hundred universities around the world viewing them. So they're having a lot of impact outside of Purdue. But everyone who's developing that coursework is also now bringing it back in the classroom, experimenting with flipped mode and blended mode. So we're doing a lot of interesting things. I think there are opportunities there. It's going to take a while to figure out exactly how to make that work. But people are diving in and trying to experiment. OK, so I'm going to wrap up. So uh, semiconductor technology, th this has been a really interesting field. It's always moved incredibly fast. I can still remember my first course in integrated circuits as an undergraduate by a fellow who set up the first IC process at Motorola. And he had been at the university for three years. And he told us, I'm now completely out of date. I can't tell you how they do it in industry. And I'll just tell you some fundamental concepts. So it's always moved fast. It's always been highly multidisciplinary. When I had my first job at uh, HP, it was before I got a PhD, it was, it was like getting a PhD. I had to learn metallurgy, I had to learn chemistry, I, we had all kinds of problems to solve that are now in the textbooks. You know, it was really a tremendous experience. You know, we've always had these predictions that were almost near the end. And we, we've never been completely sure where we're heading. I remember when HP sent me to my first technical conference. It was the Electron Devices meeting in Washington, D.C. And there was this fellow there who gave an invited talk. You know, his name was Gordon Moore. He was well known at that time, but you know, not as famous as he is now. And I still remember him saying, we are almost at the point where we could put 10,000 transistors on a chip. What could anyone possibly do with 10,000 transistors? Why should we even do this? Nobody had a good answer, but we kept doing it. People, people found a use for it. So, you know, and students coming out of universities have, have just accomplished amazing things. And, and you know, it's, you know, when you look back, it's, it's one of the, you know, the most amazing th things that has happened in human history. Maybe you're not quite what As Isaac Asimov, maybe not the most significant event, but certainly up there on a short list. And it's really been fun to be part of that, you know, and watch it as a kid tinkering around with electronics and, and to see where it's heading now. So these are my, so this is what I'm thinking about uh, what people like me and those of us in the university should do. One is there is just an almost unlimited potential for the technology that exists and which will surely continue to evolve for another 10 or 20 years. So we need to prepare our students to go out and take those jobs and seize all of those opportunities. If you're working on big data or medical electronics or artificial intelligence or robotics, you can do amazing new things because you've got the technology platform to do it. Uh, some of us who work at the basic device technology, we need to continue to work on keeping that technology moving ahead. You know, but that's focusing on the existing technology and refining and perfecting it. It's important. We don't want to leave anything on the table. But more and more of that is getting so sophisticated that it has to take place in companies. And there will be less and less of that that you can really do in a meaningful way. This is the big opportunity. You know, are there, you know, are, are there new opportunities that can be created by fundamentally different technologies than silicon MOSFETs? And I think, uh, you know, that's what, that, those are the big questions that I'm thinking about and that a lot of my colleagues in, in the MN area here are thinking about. Okay, so I think that's, I think that's it. Thank you for listening. Yes. So as, as, as we move more towards science fiction, you, you touched on it, but I wonder if you want to expand. I got the impression from what you said that, that as important as the technology is, as you begin to integrate what we think of as, as the, the manipulative physical sciences with, with, with brains and, and, and being able to, to, to do all sorts of things to, to control thought and method and, and, and mm -hmm. medical things and all of that, ethics and, and yeah. Sociology and history yeah. and, and all the all the, yeah. the you, you mentioned liberal arts. Yeah. But it sounds to me like like if we're gonna go ahead in this integrated fashion and think about what people need to know to be good at it and not to take us down a track that turns into disaster, that, that broad aspect of education becomes even more important yeah. than ever. Yeah. 
And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I think I, I, I mentioned to, to stress that, and I didn't. I think, you know, I think the right thing for Purdue is to focus on its strengths, and engineering is one of them. But we have to be careful that we don't become a vocational school because the implications of what we're doing here are just so profound. I mean, we need very broad individuals that worry about ethical and moral questions like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't. Yeah. You know, I I don't know. So one of we we've been trying to keep Nano Hub U very tightly focused on. We know what we're doing here in this confined space. It makes sense. It needs to be done, and that is bringing some fresh ways of thinking into our field, making it trying to uh, help people that need more breadth because suddenly they're working on completely different problems. How do they get started? So. You know, I'm comfortable that we're doing something that is useful. This broader question about where is distance education heading, I read everything I can find on that. I don't, I don't know where that's all going. Um, I hope, you know, one of the things that we found through NanoHub is that almost every graduate student that comes to the MN area now from Purdue has taken all of these courses on the, you know, they're all videotaped. Um, fortunately, they tell us they're even better in person. You know, so I, I mean, I think, you know, as this technology just gets better and better, we're going to have to ask ourselves, you know, what value does it add to be on campus? You know, that's that's a question for us to make sure that there is value added. I think right. it's an existential question almost because it actually questions the value of a university, right? If, yeah. Uh, so the question to me is, you know, when books came along, everybody thought, you know, books are here. Why do you need a teacher anymore, right? And then, of course, you found that there was some value added by a classroom interaction. Uh, one possibility is that these uh, online recordings and so on are a new version of a more sophisticated book-like resource. And mm -hmm. so then it will behoove us to reinvent how we teach so that we don't become an afterthought, but we add yeah. value, which is... Yeah. And I, you know, I, think we're in a, I think we're in a period where it's just going to take a lot of experimentation and hope that people try doing it different ways. And, you know, we see how this all sorts out, and I, I don't know how it's going to look 10 years from now. Well, all right, thank you again for coming. Yep.